webinar is being recorded. All right. And we're still waiting on one, one uh, Board of Health member. So we'll give a few minutes. Yeah. Tim and Morgan. Such a beautiful day today. Yeah. I spent pulling up, digging up the dahlias finally, because they had to freeze like two weeks ago before you're supposed to get them out of the ground. Yeah. And it yeah. usually freezes before November like 4th or something like that, but that was crazy this year. Mm. Yeah, I did a finished yard work. Let's see, is Lauren up yet? It's oh, I got an email. Okay, so let's see. Um, with the email from Lauren? Yes, so I'm re giving her a new screen name, and then I can promote her to panelist. It's just okay. a few steps. Yeah. Oh, it's not allowing me. But Lauren, if you can unmute, we can hear you. I don't. Lauren, can you unmute? Yeah, oh, yes, yeah, can you hear me? Oh. Okay, good. Right. So I'm not able to promote her to a panelist, but is this going to be okay if she's able to speak? Yeah. I, I, I just got home and I'm I'm going to open up my computer now, but I just wanted is the last time it was in and out, so it's better for me to, you know, I think use both on the phone so I can hear the whole meeting and then just be visible on my computer, but I'm going to open up my computer now. Sorry okay. for the. Yeah, so you can keep the, um, <laughs> you can keep the voice off the computer and. Yeah, yeah. Talk yeah. on the phone. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, I got to do all this kind of mitchy matchy stuff. Okay, but I'm here. <laughs> okay. Do you feel comfortable if we start? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, great. Okay, so I will call the meeting to order and read our usual piece. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so um, via Zoom or by the phone. Our Zoom link is on the top of the Board of Health agenda found on the Amherst Board of Health website. And the information for dial-in is at the bottom of the agenda. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post on the Board of Health website an audio recording and minutes of the proceedings as soon as possible. So I will start by roll call. So Steve? Here. Maureen? Here. Tim? Here. And Lauren? Here. Great. Okay, so the f first, um, before we even do our minutes, I wanna just congratulate Jen. She's been appointed as our full-time director and she's been doing a yeoman's job as interim director, director, public health nurse and everything. So thank you for all you've been doing and I hope we can give you all the support you need in your role as director. Oh, thank you. Nancy is the board and all the board members and everybody. It's just, it's, it's an honor. I'm really happy to be here. Great foundation and it's a great teamwork um, and looking forward to working with everybody. We have some good shared plans and goals. So. And we have such continuity. Right? <laughs> yes. uh, okay, so the first um, 
um, item on our agenda is the meeting minutes from our October 14th meeting. And then also we have our November 2nd meeting. So on the October 14th meeting, does anybody have some uh, comments? Yeah, I actually saw a couple of things. I don't know, I read these things before I send them in, but then somehow, uh, I don't know, I missed this. So under Board of Health member appointment to say that Lauren was welcomed by the board, it says, it calls us the Board of Health, the capital T, <laughs> and that's not necessary. It's not like in Boston where some people say the law school or the medical school. You know darn well what they mean, even though there are several of those institutions. We're just the law, the Board of Health. So it should not be capital uh, T. Uh, and also um, there's a completely nonsensical sentence. I do not know what I was thinking, but it is um, on the top of the second to the top of the second page. Let's see. Um, uh, oh, let me just see. Oh, sorry. It's a good sentence. The phrase is because of the decrease in volume of recyclable. Um, Which Oh yeah, it's a, it's the it's the last in the last sentence of the second paragraph under waste hauler um, zero waste committee presentation. Calculations predict that the cost of trash disposal disposal for each household should go down under this plan. That's all good, but then it says because of the decrease in oh. volume of non recyclable waste. So that's bullshit. That's nonsense. So just delete. Be because of the decrease in volume of non recyclable wastes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry about that. Yeah. And I just have one, um, a di just under toxic chemicals, 2001, Timothy and Lauren Mills will work on reviewing and revising the toxic chemical regulation. So that really we re review and then if needed, revise. Review and revise. Okay, good. Yes, good. Anybody else see anything? Okay, may I have a motion to accept the minutes as uh, corrected? Correct. Yep. Well, I'll make the okay. motion to accept the minutes as corrected. May I have a second? I'll, I'll second. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Steve? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Tim? Timothy? You're Aye. muted. Aye. <laughs> Lauren? Aye. Is that an I? Yes, I. Okay, and Nancy, I. Okay, then we have the minutes from the November 2nd when we gave a variance to Craig's doors. Um, anybody have any comments on that? No. Okay, can I have a motion to accept them? I'll make the motion to accept the minutes of the November 2nd meeting as presented. May I have a second? I'll second the motion. And Maureen, okay. All in favor, Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Lauren? Aye. Steve? Aye. And Nancy, aye. Okay. Thank you. So on under old business, we're going to review and update um, the regulations. We want to just really emphasize that we need to have a plan for routine reviewing of the regulations. And the ones that we had identified are the recombinant DNA, which were in, uh, there's a, it's 2008. Um, and what I found when I looked at them it, in the old regulations, these regulations are effective as of April 17th, 2008. The board shall annually review these regulations and may make such recommendation, amendments as it deems necessary and appropriate. So I know Maureen and Steve were 
going are going to be working on it. I didn't hear get any more information from Cheryl Sabara. I think she's very busy. Um, do you do you need time, a plan? Uh, how do you want to work? I think we sort. I think we sort of have a plan. So uh, yes, Mary and I have been in touch, and I also talked to Alex Purdy at Amherst and uh, John Castorino, who's a molecular biologist at Hampshire. Those are the only two places that our regulations affect at the moment, because we don't do UMass, and there are no companies in town that do this uh, as of now. Anyway, I think uh, certainly my idea, and Maureen can can say if she agrees with this, but these regulations are more like from 1978 than 2008. They are mm -hmm. way out of date. You know, they, and I remember, I'm probably the only one on this committee that was even alive in the 1970s, but uh, I remember <laughs> that um, that I, think we we, I was also very worried about what's going to happen with this recombinant. It was totally new. It was going to be putting a gene from, you know, a human, a human gene in, in a bacterium. And even if the human gene was innocuous and the bacterium was harmless, nobody could be sure that it wouldn't be a terrible thing, that it might create a terrible epidemic or something. So it was all to the good to have that kind of regulation. And uh, that's where that comes from. So there is no need to even lead with recombinant DNA. The recombinant DNA as a practice is not inherently dangerous. However, the town has a, a legitimate interest in preventing infectious agents from spreading, I suppose, even though no other town that we can find seems to have this regulation. A few large cities do, but, you know, Williamstown, Mass doesn't, Wellesley, Mass doesn't, Brunswick, Maine doesn't, you know, places that have colleges do not do this, but we could, you know, if we didn't have this regulation now, we would not be putting it in. Uh, so you could say, well, maybe we should just get it off the books. On the other hand, that might send the wrong message, that it's open season on doing dangerous things. So we're just going to try to scale this down, make it more reasonable, make it target the issue that is really the concern, that is the containment of infectious agents used in research. And I think we could have a much simpler, straightforward regulation without incredible threats of $4,000 worth of consulting and this and that that's in there if we do that. So that's, that's the approach that I would take. And we can do that probably by the next meeting. Um, I guess I just had questions about, as I was reading through this, if what records we have in the health department of any kind of registration or permits or inspections, did we ever do it? <laughs> I'm not aware. It, it Is really there some file to... cabinet somewhere, Jen? That... <laughs> yeah, it goes on to the director as the agent of the board. Um, well, you know, Alex Purdy at Amherst said that they have been sending certain documents that are required under this, uh, but and they asked, is this really necessary? They never got a reply, not from, not from Jennifer, but previously. Mm, no, I did. So, Jennifer just took that seat. <laughs> yeah, it's not fair to, <laughs> yes. anyway. I just wondered said, if, if, there is, if there is any history, you know, of, yeah. of this and, um, well, and also, if, if um, you know, the emergency planners or fire and, you know, have any concern, what they have any concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, we can certainly take a look here in the health department. But, you know, when health department, do we split with the health inspections and inspection services? Some things mm -hmm. are over there. So we definitely can, can dig into this. And I think in 2008, Epi Bodhi was the director um, of the health department. I think um, Julie came in 2010. Um, Julie might have been the public health nurse in 2008. She was the public health nurse, then she went to the Hadley school system. Then she came back as the director. Um, yeah, I just, and what did you find, Steve, when you talked to the folks at Amherst and Hampshire? Are there many um, level two labs? Is there any level three lab anywhere? No, there's no <laughs> level three. There is something called level two plus, which is also, I think, sometimes called level two slash three. What it means is that the organism, so it means that the lab is physically set up for level two containment. But some of the individual practices, like how many, what sort of hazmat suit people need to wear or whatever is level three. So it's a hybrid. There is none of that now, but Amherst has a new person that might do some of that research. But other than that, Amherst has only level two 
I'm obviously level one and Hampshire has only level one. Okay. Um, which we don't need to, we do, we did say we wanted them to let us know though, right? In the, oh, that the is, regulation? That, that, that I is mean, not that's messed. like student labs practically, isn't it? Exactly, no. we should not be dealing with level one at all. It is just ordinary practices. There's no indication that it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just excuse my ignorance, but, you know, I read about CRISPR and how things have gotten so easy to move genes around, et cetera, et cetera. Is there any thought that there are increased risks, not maybe even in animals and humans, but in plants or, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. One thing that Alex mentioned from Alex, who's the professor at Amherst, who's their IBC director, she said that NIH requires the preparation of a formal risk assessment for anything mm -hmm. of level two and above. And uh, that would be the sort of thing that would be included in that risk assessment. And yeah. so it would not be a huge problem for those risk assessments to be shared. In fact, I think Alex said that the predecessor of them are being shared, but she never got any feedback. She's been sending something over mm -hmm. to the health department. Uh, so asking for the risk assessment, it's sort of like the worst case scenario type of thing mm -hmm. in these experiments, which are not inherently dangerous, but you know maybe some terrible failure of containment or something. And so the health department might, might want to collect those, I guess. Mm. Not, be a, not be a problem to do that. Yeah. At level two and above, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I just got the April 17th minutes up and it says under our DNA regulations, the board reviewed input received, including input from the public hearing. Changes were made, including a permitting cost of up to $4,000. The board authorized Ms. Bodie to either confirm or lower this amount. The regulations were passed unanimously. So that to end the, the month before the minutes are online. So that's, that's all that's there. And Epi Bodie took the minutes and that's that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Maureen and I will continue to work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a quick question? You know, uh, so the biosafety and safety of uh, research labs and any labs have multiple jurisdictions from the federal government. We have state government regulations. These are like a C, you know, CDC to NIH, very strict you know, in terms of monitoring and having mm -hmm. an emergency plan and all those things. So my, my, my question is, what is not covered that we are covering? Well, one, one thing to note is that, of course, the NIH and CDC, that's not a national law. Those are guidelines, and you have to agree to it to get funding. But uh, you don't have to, you know, a person could in their basement might not follow those, and I don't think they would be in, je in violation of any law if they didn't. So that is a kind of consideration that could come in here, that... These that these are you know in fact these these guidelines say very specifically these are not regulations they're recommendations and you have to swear to follow them if you're getting funding and the local colleges have agreed to follow them whether they're federally funded or not. Mm -hmm. And I I guess I didn't actually find that there were state regulations of this this area but maybe I missed something. When I was looking, I looked at the Department Department of Health. Um, so I did see the federal guidelines, and and some towns had had regulations quite similar to this. I think I think Cambridge was like the first one in the country to do this back in the seventies, nineteen seventy seven. Um, but a lot of places where they're more intense. Um, uh, biotech companies and things seem to have a more vigorous uh, regulations of, of uh, pathogens and uh, DNA, or recombinant DNA technology. So in this uh, state regulations, the Mass Department of Public Health has one of ICMR and uh, those are regulating lab spaces, you know, on a regular basis, you know, they monitor. And I think there is a nice document developed by a Boston 
um, I think it's a Boston University that was, I'm just looking at it and I can, I can share it with you, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a biosafety and microbiological and bi biomedical labs, you know. Um, they list all the regulations at very various levels. Mm -hmm. uh, the NIH is one of them. I agree that they make the recommendations because if you're getting a funding, you have to comply and then sign off on things. Um, but there's also specific regulations on recombinant DNA technology, disease surveillance. Um, there's also select agent rule, which covered by health and human services. USDA has some, they cover some of the invasive species and uh, plant species. Um, Department of Transportation in terms of spread. So, uh, so there's a lot of guidelines everywhere and I, I just wanted to make sure um, uh, we are not, we are being some sort of not, you know, we, we, are, we don't want to actually assume that there's no <laughs> regulation and then have um, redundant type of a policy, you know, if, if we could find something which is very critical for Amherst because we are a college community and, and, and we can focus on that in our regulation. Maybe I can share that uh, page with yes. uh, Steve. That'd be great. Morning. Please do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Yeah. Well, my, one of my thoughts was, why does the town need to know about this? And I guess the, that it might be in part something to do with emergency preparedness if there was some kind of odd thing that occurred and some kind of organisms or toxins were somehow released when they shouldn't have been. But, <clears throat> but in terms of our going in and inspect, inspecting and overseeing those things, we don't have the technical capabilities of doing that. And I don't know that that makes sense. So, uh, But you know, the NIH guidelines of. do require people <coughs> to report certain types of, you know, departures from the procedures. There's some accident or something. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the uh, town guidelines just say, if you have to do that, you must also you know, tell, tell the town, town, which is a good policy. Mm -hmm. I think at our last meeting, Steve, you talked about biosafety. I think looking at this regulation as safety in case there is a release of something and also to know where, where some of this experimentation might be going on. So we know, it, we know it's at Amherst College. Um, unfortunately, we don't know what's going on at UMass, and a lot is going on at UMass. But if there was anything that got into our uh, uh, systems, um, our, uh, our um, sewer system, or anything, where what happens? Where does it go? If it's if it goes into the air, um, is there a safety issue? So I, I think it's really knowing where it is in case there is an accident or a departure from um, something that's safe. Yeah. I think that's um, good. So keeping it I, as you said, as simple as possible um, to promote safety. And can I just ask a clarifying question? Are we talking about um, biosafety that is happening in in the two colleges that we we are connected to somehow we oversee and you said it's Amherst and Hampshire. Yep. Yes. That's right, yeah. Yes. Because somehow for reasons that aren't clear to us, the UMass is not under our jurisdiction in this uh, case. I think but UMass so, is not under jurisdiction for many things, right? I mean, right. we don't, we don't, we can't make a mask mandate down there or anything. So it uh, looks like uh, we need a risk mapping or risk assessment, you know, on where the hotspots are. And, and, this, and the second part is going to be emergency preparedness. I probably that is uh, where emergency offices are probably are prepared for that. So any type of an outbreak. But I'm, I think those are two things, I think if something we could be prepared, you know, mm -hmm. and keep it updated. If it's outdated, you know, probably that is something we should think about. You know. I'm just wondering uh, who is the contact um, for um, the Amherst College and Hampshire College Labs? 
you said in Hampshire college is a level one and that's the lowest level. So yep. what what is it that we need to know directly from the actual colleges? Is that is that a good question? Yeah. So in other words, I think what Timothy is saying is we should know if there's if there's research being done at level two or higher. There won't be any level three at either of those institutions, but there could be that level two plus or something. So for those, we, we should want to know about that it's being done and what the, and we would like to know their risk assessment that they're required to make. So we would get nothing from Hampshire basically because they're not doing anything above level one, but we would get that information from Amherst. And I guess if you have level two or above, you also have to have this biosafety committee um, and on the campus. So um, that's who Steve was communicating with is the, the, the director of the biosafety committee at Amherst. That, and I don't think Hampshire has that or I, or do they? Right. The, yeah, the, I just identified the person there who was doing that kind of work and that's John mm -hmm. uh, Castorino, but he said there's, they have a person who's the manager of their science building and mm -hmm. she does all the stuff about lab safety and so on. So mm -hmm. I know who she is. And so she would be the one that we would be dealing with there. Okay. If we deal, if we do, I think we have sure will be, except for assuring us that they're not above level one, I think we won't be dealing with them at all. Okay. Any other discussion? Oh, okay. um, quick, quick, um, I mean, related to that, uh, in addition to the risk mapping, we wanted to know what is the liability, you know. Um, you know, if there is some sort of a accident or whatever it is, and who is liable? <laughs> I mean, that it usually, you know, in legal terms, it's, it comes under strict liability, you know, because if you're holding a dangerous substance, you know. <laughs> Um, but that is something, you know, we also need to explore, you know, uh, in our emergency preparedness, you know, so. I, I'm a little confused because if it's some, if it's on a campus, then the liability would be with the, the campus. So I, I'm, I'm not able to see exactly the, the, um, the, the, the uh what what we're trying to um draft for this for biosafety um i'm trying to you know find it in my emails but i'm just wondering i i just i'm, I'm trying to understand what what the town we're trying to deescalate or decrease the risk or find out what the risk is um if somebody could just clarify that for me i'm sorry that's okay. No, that's a good question. Yeah, I think the idea is that, you know, if there was, I mean, it's not going to happen, but if there was some kind of disease outbreak, it could, wouldn't necessarily be limited to the campus. It could affect the whole town. But this is something that is would be very hard to imagine at the level of danger that these experiments are. But the fact is, the colleges have to supply that risk assessment in the worst case scenario. And if it were to become would be released through water, air, however it's transmitted, even a vector. So, you know, that, that that's what the, this risk would be at the very, very worst case scenario. Isn't it possible to, I mean, it's more, more worse if it comes from like that animal or testing on some animals. I don't, I know, I don't know if they do that at Amherst or Hampshire, but um, I'm just thinking like, uh, things that are used in, in the agriculture and the farming, like that could easily get into, you know, drinking water or something like that, but we can test for those things. So I guess I, I'm just, I'm just asking questions right now because I'm a little unclear. Uh, I, I, just to clarify, I think this is not the regular pollutants we are talking about like nutrients or sediment or pesticides. And I mean, I think here, these are some dangerous, you know, biological agents, you know, primarily in the experimental stage. And the thing is, we have wanted to know what is the risk management and what is the risk um, 
we need to know from those people who do the research, you know, so, so, so that we could be prepared or is there any emergent preparedness, you know. So. Okay. So do you, Maureen and Steve, do you think you'll have a draft of something for our December meeting? Possibly. <laughs> okay, or, or January. Definitely by January, yeah. Hopefully January. December, but definitely. Okay, so you'll have it to us by January and we'll yeah. look at the draft. And then Lauren, what we'll do is we'll look at our old regulations and our new revised regulations, and then we'll discuss it in move on from, um, to eventually accept our revised ones. After a hearing, of course, after uh, a public okay. hearing. Yes, yes, after a public hearing. Um, although, you know, there was no public hearing on that last one, <laughs> uh, per se. Okay, so the next one is the, um, toxic chemical regulation. And that is an old one. It was adopted um, in April 9th, 2001. And, it, and under, it says variants, which were besides the regulation, it says if a non-toxic replacement product cannot be used for any reason, a variance must be obtained from the health director or his, her designee. And one reason we're looking at it is A, it's 20 years old and B, um, it was brought to our attention that House Bill 926 was uh, in the state looking at pesticide protection for children in schools. And we do know that in the past five years, Roundup was used, I believe it was at Groff Park or Mill River um, in a very small area for um, poison ivy that was not responding to hand picking. So we might want to add um, besides town buildings, public spaces such as park, recreation areas, school grounds, um, where a possibility of using Roundup is. So Tim and Lauren, we're going to be looking at that one to review it and come up with some possible revisions. So the toxic chemical regulation, which was developed in 2001, 20 years ago, um, regulates the use in public properties, right? Right. Essentially uh, products like chlorine-free paper or products in you know town yes. town buildings and all those things so yes. so uh, we are restricting to these type of public spaces right for this revision right. okay. and you know we may think this is is adequate but i think we just we do need to just review it um, and lauren we suggested you do it because be on it because you have children in schools and a lot of it is uh, on school property. Okay. Nancy, there's a, a question. Are we taking questions now? Or are we going to wait until well, the wait, end? wait, let me just see. If, I'll open it up for any discussion uh, in a minute. Okay. So yes, we can. I don't see it. Who has the question? John Root has his hand raised. Oh, it's down. Oh, no, it's up. Oh, it's up. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, John, do you have a question? Can, oh, He's muted. There. Oh, lot, yeah. Unmute okay. yourself. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. I, have a, I have a comment, uh, and that is that. Um, uh, I attended a presentation, uh, Zoom presentation, just yesterday evening uh, with an expert from the Xerces Society uh, for invertebrates. And so this was about uh, uh, you, the use of uh, pesticides in management of insects and, uh, and other pests. And her comment about glyphosate was that uh, 
the, the primary concern is that if you use glyphosate when plants are in bloom, that can put pollinators at risk. So I just wanted to give you that piece of information that if glyphosate is used, care should be taken to make sure, or uh, it should be timed in such a way uh, that it won't pose a risk to pollinators uh, be because uh, plants nearby are in bloom. Okay. Thank you. So Tim and Lauren, will you, you know, have a, a call? How, how do you want to make a plan for looking at this? So what is the timeline on this? You can pick any timeline. <laughs> yeah, don't give, uh, you know, I can't do that in the next couple of months, you know, so it may be um, in the next three months, you know, we can, we can develop some draft, you know. So by April? Yeah, we can, we okay. have to do some uh, maybe meetings and uh, uh, do some literature review and update because it's already 20 years old. Right. Um, uh, a lot of new things which happened in between, you know, so. You've yeah. been looking at other, other towns to see what they have yeah. for their toxic chemical regulations. Uh, is it specifically as it pertains to where children play? Because you said that's what it's specific to. So should we make our research specific to that? Or play and 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 in in school zones? Well, it seems the current regulation also covers just people who work in buildings in Amherst as well. I mean, it's not specific to school children, but certainly they're among our most vulnerable parts of our population. So I think they're an important part of that question. Mm -hmm. So that's for you and Tim to decide when you, after you do your research. Okay. And so uh, under open meeting laws, you and Tim can work together and then present to the board and that, that's fine. So two people can talk about an issue and work on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. you'll have something to us by April. That seems a little far away to me. I don't see why it would take that long, but okay. <laughs> well, you and Tim communicate. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see, we'll see. But that gives us some leeway, but I don't think it's going to take that long. Okay. 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 So then regulations for refuse collection and mandatory recycling, which we touched on last week, uh, last month because of the waste hauler zero waste committee. And um, what I did is I, I did a lot of review and I just wanna give a recap to you. So I reviewed the Board of Health regulations for refuse collection and mandatory recycling. We first accepted these regulations in 1989. It's, they have been reviewed and revised seven times over the last 32 years. And the last two revisions were in 2009, Susan Waite, the recycling coordinator, came to the board and recommended an amendment to the regulations to require commercial properties to recycle and the board accept, approved that. In 2014, the DPW came to the board and asked to add pay-as-you-go bags for residents who use the transfer station, and the board approved that. Amherst no longer has a recycling coordinator. Um, the position was established in 2006, and Susan Waite was the first and only coordinator, and that position was eliminated in 2015, and Susan became the waste reduction coordinator coordinator for Northampton. And over the summer, she moved to Western Mass DEP um, for waste reduction and, and recycling. 
Amherst has had a recycling and refuse management committee. It was first established in 2005 as the Solid Waste Committee. In 2007, it changed its name to Recycling and Refuse Management Committee to better describe the issues that it addressed. Their last meeting was March 29th of 2019, 18, I mean, when it was subsumed in the Sustainability Committee. Um, and it's called Sustaining Amherst, which is a single place for residents to find information on all the green efforts happening in Amherst. Uh, on that site, there's seven links and Stephanie, uh, Sicarello is the coordinator. In two, November of 2017, the select board accepted Amherst Zero Waste Master Plan. We now have Zero Waste Amherst, which started in January 2020. They had their first meeting right before the pandemic. And their mission is that they're a resource for moving the town of Amherst towards zero waste through planning, policy initiatives, legislation, education, and community engagement to reduce toxic pollution. Zero Waste Amherst brought a proposal to the Board of Health at our October meeting for a pilot project with four elements to transition away from subscription services with hauler to either direct provision by the town or a town contract with a hauler to provide curbside compost pickup in the basic service to include pay as you throw fee structure so the smaller your container for trash the less you will be paying and adding local compost processing to re, uh, and reuse so that's what's been happening locally on the state level, the Mass Department of um, uh, DEP under uh, 310 CMR 19.006, as of November 23rd, uh, 2023, there'll be a ban on mattresses and textiles, including clothing, footwear, towels, curtains, fabric for disposal or transfer dis for disposal, and they're going to lower the threshold for commercial organic and food waste to a half a ton per week. Their goal is by 2025 to 2030 to decrease the disposal volume by 30% and ban all organics. And right now there are 11 state and 49 local, meaning town, active landfills in Massachusetts and every year they are decreasing. What we are doing is we are ex increasing exporting of refuse um, at an, a larger volume and we export to Maine, New Hampshire and Ohio and our recycling goes to Springfield. Right now, the seven combustion facilities in Massachusetts are presently operating at capacity. There's one in Pittsfield, one in Springfield, which just whatever they're burning comes right up the valley. Haverhill, Saugus, Millbury, uh, North Andover and Rochester are the other combust combustion facilities. So refuse collection and recycling is a regulation of the Amherst Board of Health. And what happens to the refuse does affect public health in town. So what I would like to do is I would like to move to have the health department create a working group um, who, and that group would review the present regulations and establish elements of a pilot program to be provided directly by the town or through a town contract with one or more haulers that would include curbside trash, recycling and compostable material pickup in a basic service, a pay as you throw fee structure and local compostability for materials processing and reuse. And it would be a seven member appointed working group by, appointed by the health department with two board of health members, 
one DPW staff member appointed by Guilford Mooring, one sanitarian, either Susan Malone or Ed Smith, Stephanie Sicarello, who's the sustaining Amherst coordinator, two zero waste Amherst members, and the health director as an ex officio member. With an update on their work by March of 2023, a final report June of 2023, so that if we are moving forward, we can have a public hearing in September of 2023 and a start date of January, um, no, uh, update of March 2022, sorry, final report of June 2022, public hearing September 2022, and a start date of January 2023. So now it's open for discussion. You need a seconder, though. Pardon me? Don't you need a second? Um, oh, yes. You made, a motion. you made a motion. Very long motion. Yes. Yes. Well, I gave the history and the, mo the motion was, so I gave you the history and the motion was, um, and I can send it to you. So well, I need you better darn well said it, yes. <laughs> so I need a second on the motion. I'll second the motion. Okay, now it's open for discussion first by board members and then by attendees. Well, Nancy, first of all, could you just say you made a very specific statement there, and I, you know, I'm all in favor of the town going in this direction, but I still want to know. You said that putting compostables, you know, that dealing with compostables other than recycling is a public health problem. I would really like to know exactly no, what no. is. What is happens to refuse is a public health. No, problem. no, but we're not talking about that. Yes, we of course we're going to worry about refuse and all that chromium and everything else. That's a very bad thing. We're talking about compostables here. So but how do compostables I'm represent? talking about all of it. So uh, compostables is part. It's like what we do with the trash. So if we keep compostables out of our trash. How, how does putting compostables in the trash cause health problems? I'm talking about what happens to the trash when it's picked up and leaves here. Going to Springfield and being burned is a public health issue. Uh, yes, and maybe that's why uh, Springfield is like the highest, um, has the highest asthma rate. I, I think that, um, I think that this, the, this program or um, the zero waste um, project doesn't really take into account um, one for me, the those who live in apartment complexes, I don't think we should wait or put that off. I, I understand you want to you know implement a pilot program, but I'm concerned that it doesn't encompass you know people residents who live in apartment complexes, and I don't understand why why not if we want to you know get rid of trash in a in a more environmentally safe way um that's one of my, my one of my problems with, with with the um with the proposal is that it should include apartment complexes so what has happened in the past Lauren is even with the recycling, it started as the town and then in 2009, it went to um, commercial properties were, reco were required to recycle. So it started, uh, it, it's very hard to start across the whole board. We'd have to pilot to see how it goes. And then we would have to have a lot of input in how it would move on to other um, properties, uh, uh, large properties, such as apartment complexes. Maybe that could be included in the plan, you know, that not, you know, to say this, is, we're going to start here, but we'll have some goals to get to the commercial properties within a certain amount of time. So a phase in. Yeah. You mean the apartment complexes. Yeah. Okay. 
I have another question. I have a question here. So <clears throat> I know we have the authority to do this. And I, I was questioning that last time, but I'm completely convinced, yes, the Board of Health, if it is going to be done, it will be voted by the Board of Health uh, through the process that you're outlining. So I understand we have the, the uh, power to do it. I do think that there's a lot of things that the Board of Health has a power to do in terms of regulation and enforcement that we do not do. They, we, things that we think you know, we have a reason to do it, but we find a countervailing reason, such as that there's a better way to do it than a, a force of law, get people to do it other ways. And we all we, we think that way all the time. And so I have a concern about this idea of public support. And I think that the zero waste people have given us all these endorsements and I respect all the organizations that, uh, that, they're, they're, that have endorsed it. But here's the thing, most people, most residents in Amherst use one particular hauler that is USA Recycle, maybe all of them, but I, I think there's another, some that are authorized. USA Recycle provides by subscription, bi-weekly curbside pickup of organics, including animal products, which is hard to recycle, hard to compost at home. They provide the very thing that is being asked for here. And yet very few people, apparently, I don't have a number, but it seems very few people in the town do it. So unless we're saying that words speak louder than actions, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of public support for doing this. Well, and to the Board of Health, if they're gonna do a regulation like this, it's, you know, if it doesn't have a direct public health impact, and I just do, I'm not convinced that the compostables really do. I feel like it's, we should know that there is public support and these endorsements are great, but the people are showing by their actions in the town of Amherst that they apparently don't support this. So I'd just like somebody to say, maybe when there's open and the time for public comment, we could hear from the zero waste people about this, but does anybody on the board have a assessment that's different, that there is public support for this? I've asked, Several people and I and I was at a group and um, there's a neighborhood um, brunch and people when I asked what they thought of it were very supportive of it. Why don't they? Why don't they subscribe to the service that does the very thing? Because that it's, they were it's ten or fifteen dollars more each month and the price, the cost for Amherst uh, trash hauling is quite expensive now. It's like five hundred dollars a year. Well, now, if you're saying that the reason for do this is money, that's totally different than saying that it's a public. No, but I mean, that's why perhaps there are not as many people um, subscribing to that service. I think with with having a town negotiate, if you look at the costs for re for trash hauling in parts, different towns like Longmeadow is way cheaper than Amherst. Why should that be? That's those are fine reasons. It's nothing to do with public health. Nothing but, whatever. So that's fine. But I think so. I, I, you know, and I think a lot. And then some people do their own composting because they can. Um, but I, I, I think in some ways we're kind of overall responsible for what happens to the trash Amherst makes and where it goes and whether it ends up, you know, into the air or into to uh, the ocean or into wherever. Um, and, and, and it does have an overall effect on the health of the people of the world and us and the whole um, environment. So, okay. um, and we have had these regulations under the Board of Health since 1989 for refuse collection and mandatory recycling. So refuse, I don't, I, I think I agree that refuse is really connected to public health. So a couple of things I, I, you might I want to clear for, clarify. Composting, if it's being pulled and taken somewhere, it is a health hazard somewhere else. That means you have when you're treating, there are research which are essentially saying there is uh, air pollutants from the, um, from couple of, uh, so this is coming from epidemiology research which came in. Uh, composting facilities are having aspergillus fumigators and thermophilic actomycetes. These are compost dust 
uh, going downstream and most of the time that is a health hazard. So, uh, we are actually creating some sort of a, some, you know, a problem somewhere else, so that is one thing. Of course, the incinerators are definitely composting of uh, adding composting to inter incinerators, the volume will decrease, but we are not dealing with any heavy metals or anything which is going to come in uh, with this incinerator. So, it is still going to be there, you know, whether you add compost or not, because this is going to be in carbon dioxide or methane emissions. So, I wanted to address this one because this one was promoted as an environmental justice issue. So, here we are, we are talking about composting where people can actually compost in their backyard, which I do. It is, I use it for my, so you are recycling your nutrients. Instead of that, we are pooling, a, asking a hauler to take it to a composting centralized facilities, which is a, sometimes a massive operation. Often there is this dust, compost dust, which is having a public ha hazard for the local communities. I do not know where it is going and a lot of times that is a public health hazard for them, you know, especially for asthma and any type of lung infections. And so, that is one thing. The second thing I am also um, um, bringing up is the quantity of uh, compost itself. So, we have uh, the estimates say that roughly around 6 pounds per week is the, is the volume, volume of from a 2 adults and 2 kids, you know. Uh, this is a study across many cities in, uh, cities in the US. Uh, again, you need a volume which is reasonable for the hauler to bring in the economics of scale, you know. That means, the price should come down. With 7 pounds difference, my worry is you might, we might end up with higher cost by the haulers because they have to create maybe new uh, uh, bins or new type of collection equipment or whatever it is and new uh, trips. So, the economics plays a big role. That is why last time I, I, I emphasized that we need an economic analysis is need to be done so that you know it, it will be an informed one for our citizens to make a decision. Do any other board members have any comments before we open it up to attendees? Okay, so we have hands raised for attendees. So Christina Platt. Nancy, excuse me, do you want me timing the, the limit, uh, putting the limit on the? Yes. The, like two three, minutes. three minutes, two minutes. It's two to three minutes. Okay. Two minute warning with one minute wrap up. Okay. Okay. So Christina Platt, uh, her hands up, but I don't, I can't unmute her. Let me see if I can. So Christina, can, can you unmute yourself? I, yeah, there we go. Did that do it? Yes. yes. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to uh, address the issue of um, why we want to take compost out of the trash stream. And I guess it also works into backyard composting. Um, I did backyard compost for probably close to 20 years. And uh, I'm just not um, interested in doing it anymore. And I tried to get my neighbors to cooperate and we could do it together. So I didn't actually know myself until I learned from Darcy that USA offered that service and I'm going to sign up for it now. They don't really advertise it uh, unless that they didn't mention it when they changed over the service from uh, Amherst Trucking. They didn't offer that as one of their services, but you can get it. They don't bundle it, but you can get it as an extra one. But again, we're looking at taking, if we don't reduce the amount that in the trash stream, that has to be either incinerated or put into landfills. And you, you contaminate the recycling stream with compost. You know, you can't uh, have that in, in your recycling for paper, glass, or plastic if it's full of food scraps and bosses and stuff like that. So there are a lot of reasons why 
the Board of Health would be concerned with uh, getting compostables managed in a, in a better, uh, larger scale way. Okay, thank you, Christina. Does anyone have a comment for that? Okay, John. Well, just, let's just listen to the let's listen to the comments without without the board, and then we'll finish the comments. John, uh, let's see if you unmute yourself. Whoops. Yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, first, I'd I'd like to comment uh, in terms of the motion, uh, Nancy. You, I think you mentioned uh, the size of the. Uh, receptacle uh, uh, would would be commensurate with what the uh, individual uh, individual households would uh, pay, and you might want to add to that the frequency of pickup. That's another way uh, to incentivize. In other words, uh, you could have the same. Um, uh, and and I'm not sure what uh, that that's what this group uh, uh, the uh, the motion you made this group would talk about these the, uh, these options. But that is one option, not only to reduce the size or or select the size of. of uh, the uh, the bin for uh, waste, but also uh, to select a, a frequency of pickup. Uh, I wanted to comment about the health uh, impacts of uh, compostables, of organic matter. Uh, particulates is a word that I'm not sure if it's, it's uh, been mentioned in our discussions to date. It is a huge concern. And uh, of course, we don't know uh, what USA Hauling is, is doing with the trash that we give it. Uh, that, that the trucks pick up. We don't know if it's being burned or buried, but either one uh, must be seen as caveman technology. There is simply no advanced technology uh, to either burn or bury trash. Uh, so uh, the burying has to do with, uh, you know, every, uh, the, the liner uh, of uh, landfills is guaranteed to fail after 30 years. <laughs> there was no, there's no guarantee past 30 years of any liner. Uh, and that means leachates going into the, into the ground. But but incineration uh, uh, results in particulates, and there are no filters that catch those particulates. And particulates are very insidious for public health. I also wanted to comment that in terms of, uh, you know, we're talking about two things, uh, our responsibility to other communities and our responsibility to our own community. And so the public health hazards of, uh, of, of burning anything, including uh, organics, uh, do result in particulates and uh, it being released. And uh, I, my understanding of our own uh, situation here in Amherst is that we receive uh, pollution, including particulates uh, from the Midwest. You know, uh, we, we know no borders uh, in terms of waste, uh, in terms of um, these, these emissions. So it's important not to, you know, in, the, in this time of uh, global climate change, we often think about carbon dioxide, but, it, but we're when we're talking about trash, it's yes, carbon dioxide is a, is a concern, uh, but pollution certainly is, is huge as well. Um, so, uh, I, I, and I also wanted to comment that a big part of this proposal is the pay as you throw component. So, uh, the uh, uh, I, even if, uh, well, it's just, it, it, in other words, that that's part of the motivation to get people to use those, uh, that third receptacle that we would be offering curbside uh, if there's a compost uh, or organics uh, receptacle uh, I think uh, that I think it, uh, and if it's seen as, as routine now uh, uh, to, to address uh, Christina's point everyone would, at that point would know okay we do have, just like now we know we have two bins then everyone would know there's a third bin and you wouldn't have to, an extra uh, charge to to put things in your uh, bin I excuse also want to comment me, John, this that's three minutes so if you can start thinking oh, okay. about that. Yeah, uh, thank just, you. just a couple real uh, if, if I may um, the, uh, uh, let's see, I was trying to think, um, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the fact that this, this is really important, uh, I mean, one fact is that United, United States as a country is far more uh, egregious in terms of the volume of waste per, uh, uh, disposed of per individual. So, uh, and so it, it can, it certainly is something that it's, it's a high time that we take more responsibility and the West Coast, they do it a lot more uh, consistently. Um, so, uh, uh, and I'll, the final thing I wanted to say was that, uh, yes, the, I think we did de demonstrate support when our, our committee that I was a chair of, uh, when we submitted our solid waste master plan, we also did a, a survey 
and while you, we can't really maintain that this is a, a representative sampling of, of the people who submitted the survey. However, there was significant uh, uh, support. So I wanted to add that to, to the endorsements that we already uh, have gotten from organizations. The, uh, this survey itself from, from the populace also shows significant uh, support. Thank you. Darcy, let's see. Un whoops. Okay. You should be able to. Did you unmute yourself, Darcy? Yeah, I, I think. Darcy? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to very much thank the board for continuing to consider this. And um, I think that you, you saw that we are in the process of doing some fairly massive outreach. Um, the, the um, you know, we shared that we have seven endorsers now. The most notable is the Energy and Climate Action Committee that endorsed it yesterday. Um, and we have many outstanding requests and are really trying to get it out there, including in our article that we put in the bulletin, um, which I think you probably all saw. Um, also, I just wanted to update you that we, we met with, um, we've been trying to do our homework. We met with Susan Waite, who's now the DEP coordinator and, and Catherine Rate of the Pioneer Village Planning Council to, get, to try to get feedback from them uh, about uh, you know, their ideas and whether they can provide technical assistance or funding to help this along. And we got a lot of ideas from them, which we would be glad to share, although we don't think we don't have time now, but we did, one of the things that they offered was that they definitely have a technical, you know, a grant possibility that could pay for all of the new to toters that would be needed to be the compost toters. Um, so that could really be, that could be something that the town of Amherst could offer in a contract situation. So, um, uh, I also would like to uh, reassure you that we absolutely considered um, that apartment complexes and um, commercial ventures, businesses and institutions will all be part of this plan. We are considering that a part of the proposal, just not part of phase one. And so, but we would like to get started with um, community groups looking at um, how it's going to be done in apartment complexes just because there are more challenges with, with uh, dumpsters. And so we would want to, uh, you know, invite people to be, um, you know, have a seat at the table trying to figure out how that next phase would be done. So, um, yeah, um, I'm, I, I'm, I am very, uh, I hope that you'll be able to support this motion that the chair put forward. It seems like it will help uh, put this, help this move forward so we can decide what the elements would be in um, a recommended program. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, board, do you have any questions? Nancy, the you, you made a list of the committee that you were proposing. I think there were seven people on it. Yes. It went by pretty fast. Is any of them elected? Um, no. So in other words, it's possible that this would go through that process and then come to us and the entire thing would be put into place because we have the authority to do it by people, by not a single elected person. Well, we can add... Them. You can you can say you want to add an elected person on here. You're going to not get eight. Or you can hard to get seven people to meet at the same time. So no, 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 you shouldn't. But I'm that is a concern. I, I really feel that this is a very important thing to do. I'm all for it. I just think it's a town wide thing. It has to eventually have buy in. So where do um, we start then? I don't know. So I, I thought we were just going to at least start by getting a request for quotes. Um, which would be a way to get the town sort of involved at a higher level, at least. And that's something the council would be aware of if the money was made clear. But I guess maybe that we're not ready for that yet. Uh, so no, it seems to me like the working group would have to put together a plan and then get 
kind of quotes or have some discussions with haulers and try to come up with what seems like a reasonable plan and get quotes. I think we're really, it's hard to know what's putting the horse before the cart in terms of figuring this out. Um, I, I, yeah. I don't I know just how we get elected officials involved in this since it's not the select boards, uh, not the select boards, but the council's um, purview. It's, you know, um, you, I don't know. To be, if it is not, if it is not the council's purview, if it's only our purview, it's got to have more public health relevance to me because it's all to the good, but the good is everything but public health. And so that's why I'm really concerned that, it, that there's not going to be a broader consensus okay, so from Steve, people who really know how it works. regulations are ours. Can we I are regulating what's happening now. And, and yeah. I, it's like, it's maybe not optimal the way things are right now, um, but we have that regulation and that's what it is. And it's not the town council and it's not the, the town manager, it's, it's us. <laughs> um, it's well, been us for 32 years. <laughs> Hello. It does, I mean, I was surprised by that myself, to be honest, but uh, <sighs> You know, it, it's, I guess how the town's waste management has always has been managed that way for a long time by the Board of Health. Lauren had something, you know. Yeah, Lauren. Lauren. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think um, we, we have to stop arguing about is it a public health issue or not, because everybody has trash. It's a question of you know, are we, how, how effective are we um, disposing of that trash and, and, and not doing damage to the environment, whether it's far away or it's, you know, time, the time that we're not living, but, you know, far into the future or years into the future. And, and for me, um, I think when you talked about the committee sustaining Amherst, if that's a committee um, um, by Stephanie Chicarello, that that would be a good place to start because I know there are a lot of residents who are passionate about, you know, um, gardening and, you know, would like to, you know, have an easier way to separate their their food trash from their, as they said in the, the article, the, the bulky, the bulky um, items. So I just, um, I just think that we need to not make this issue such a like dividing issue on the, the board because I don't, I don't think it's just the, the, the board, the board of health that has to take this on. Um, I think the, the committees that are the environmental committees, such as was stated, like sustaining Amherst, they definitely have a role to play. And I would like to know what if um, Darcy um, and the others who are, you know, putting this forward have spoken to them already or or not. Thank you, Lauren. Darcy, have have you uh, I, um, included the sustaining Amherst? Yes, the sustaining Amherst is um, basically Stephanie Carrillo, and she mm -hmm. is staff to the Energy and Climate Action Committee, and they um, have included zero waste as one of the goals in the Climate Action Plan. So this is part of why we're putting it forward is that it is part of the town's plan now in any event. Um, and so, yes, but the, the Energy and Climate Action Committee doesn't have the authority like the Board of Health does to actually do anything about it. Um, so that's why we're coming to the Board of Health because you have the jurisdiction uh, over your own regulations to do something about it. Thank you. 
Did that answer your question, Lauren? Yeah, but when you say do something about it, that that's unclear to me. You know. Well, it, uh, what I'm saying is that the Board of Health can, um, through its regulations, um, require the town to uh, carry out this proposal that Zero Waste Amherst is putting forward. Um, but uh, the Energy and Climate Action Committee does not have that authority. But the, does the Board of Health, they don't have the ability to make the town pay for the pilot or pay for parts of the, the program that you need to have funded. So I, I just think that you're putting a lot on, on, on this board when, you know, we, we haven't really been able to digest all of the, the proposal. It just feels like, I, I don't know, it just feels a little um, like you're asking the, the board to do a little too much of the work. I think the proposal is not to 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 do it, but to create a working group to make a recommendation. Okay, I, it's already six sixteen, so I am going to. Is there another hand up? No. Um, do you see another hand? No. Um, so I am going to sort of closed discussion. So we have the motion, it was seconded, correct? Yes. So I'm gonna call the question now so that we can vote on it. Um, whether we want to have Jennifer from the health department create this working group to review the present regulations and establish elements of the pilot program. There was way more to the motion. Could you read the full motion? Okay. Move that the health department create a working group that would review the present regulations and establish the elements of a pilot program to be provided directly by the town or through a town contract with one or more haulers that would include curbside trash, recycling, compostable materials, pickup in a basic service, a pay-as-you-throw fee structure, and local compostable materials processing and reuse. It would be a seven-member working group with two Board of Health members a DPW staff member appointed by Guilford Mooring, one sanitarian, either Susan Malone or Ed Smith, Stephanie Sicarello from the Sustaining Amherst Coordinator, the Sustaining Amherst Coordinator, two zero waste Amherst members, and the health director as an ex officio member. To give us an update, March 2022 with a final report June 2022. If we're moving forward with this, we could have a public hearing by September 2022 with a start date of January 2023. And I can email that to you, Steve. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. So that is the, the motion. So I'm gonna call it. Um, Maureen. Aye. Lauren. Um, Lauren, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Are you, uh, do you support this motion? Um, at, at this, well, I, I get, uh, yes, 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 okay. okay. Yes. Steve. Aye. Aye. Tim? Aye, refrain. And Nancy, aye. Okay, so Jen, that puts it to you to get this working group in order because you're our agent. Okay, I have my marching orders. 
thank you very much, everybody. So, uh, next on old business is the tobacco violation order update. So, uh, quick update um, the Spirit House did pay their $2,000 fine for their second violation of selling tobacco to under a, uh, under a person under the minimum legal sales age. Um, they paid their fine $2,000. Um, they had their seven day suspension. And just FYI, if they have a third violation, it's $5,000 and a 30 day suspension, but I hope they won't go there. So that, that was paid. That's my update. I'll speak later about the tobacco handler quiz. Okay, so new business, um, health director update. Okay, so I want to talk just about some statistics. I think we're all following what's going on uh, pretty much, but just to sort of talk about that our plateau, we are off our plateau and cases are going up. Um, it's not unexpected. Um, people are moving indoors and uh, into more densely populated situations. Um, and also, we're sort of seeing that people are beginning to act almost normal and sort of there's more human interactions. So the numbers are going up slowly. They're just, it's not a big increase, but we see them now 35 active cases, just as a comparison um, a month ago, um, we were at six cases. The 14 day incidence rate a month ago was 2.0 and is now we're back up to 7.6. So that's in Amherst. And also the CDC County Tracker for Hampshire County, before we were in substantial transmission rate, which was an orange color, we're now back up into the red at a high risk um, transmission risk. So in terms of the mask mandate, um, I'd like to personally see it continue for five weeks or so, and we'll take a look at it in January. I can tell you from firsthand that um, transmission or spread we're seeing in large events in Amherst. So, so there's not a big number that we have, but it's through families and family events. So we have Thanksgiving, we have Christmas, we have New Year's. So I think if we can have all the mitigation strategies in place, it's just gonna be safer for our population. So talking about all of mitigation strategies, um, COVID vaccine clinics are continuing in Amherst. Um, there's one right now, if you see me jump off, we're just finishing up and I can tell you we did all Pfizer and we did 161 people. So thank you all you volunteers that are still down there vaccinating. Um, we've also done some smaller clinics um, for the uh, younger kids. We were in the school, so we vaccinated them. Um, that was at Fort River, Wildwood, and Crocker Farm. And we also have a bus coming now to the high school. And this bus is from Bay State, and they're opening up to anyone that wants to get vaccinated next Tuesday, which is the 23rd, I believe. Um, and they're gonna continue that five to 11 group. Our vaccine rate in Amherst, we've recalculated it with a new formulation. And I'd like to thank Steve George. And also we've had um, assistance with Carlo Della Piccola, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, using their um, calculations, um, it was a good calculation when we started and now we have new information. We're at people that have had at least one vaccine in, in Amherst is at 91%. Wow. So Jen, I just wanna put a little piece in here. Um, I heard uh, via a neighbor and through Mike Morris, Jen is really, moving towards equity in um, uh, vaccination of children. And can you give us the date because you are really um, earmarking getting to children that are on free and reduced uh, rate lunches and um, 
and other groups. Do you want to just share that information? I think you're doing an excellent job oh. in making sure this is more equitable. Yeah, thank you so much. So when we went to the schools, the kids that were identified for being vaccinated, 72% were identified as students of color, 29% were English language learners, 52% qualify for subsidized lunch, and 29% of students were vaccinated with special needs. So I thank Meg Morris for compiling those stats and sharing them with us. So that's who we were targeting here. Um, so I feel it was a very successful um, vaccination. Thank program. you again for promoting equity yeah. in vaccine. Yeah, excellent. Um, As that was not done in the spring um, with, with the older children, school yeah. children vaccine. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just, it's a great team here. And, you know, the next two months, I think our, you know, our way out of this, this pandemic is really getting people vaccinated. So that still needs to be the priority. And we still have people in town that have not received their first. So that's where the work comes to us to figure out how to reach those folks. Um, any questions about the COVID stats? Just one thing I want everyone to um, know is that we've signed on, and this may be old, you may know it, with um, a public health excellence grant out of Northampton. So they're looking at a more um, a regionalized uh, approach to public health. So we're working with Northampton, and they're going to be um, giving us support with contact tracing. So that's a really great service. And also um, they'll have nurses that we can call upon for um, interventions and any kind of programs. So I love seeing things being thought about in a regionalized way. Um, it's, it's just gonna, gonna be sort of more, more streamlined. Um, we have uh, things that will support people, different towns, and we can mix and match that. So I'm very happy to Northampton for doing that for us. That's my update. Okay, so the other new business is we do have the statement on racism and public health, and now we need to identify actions and our next steps. And so... Uh, the last part of our statement, it says that we're committed to the following actions, assessing the community health needs through comprehensive community assessment that focuses on health inequities, increasing funding for the health department, evaluating policies, procedures, and regulations to ensure racial equity, and support local, state, and federal initiatives. Also, the State came out with a blueprint for health equity on July 1st, 2021. I don't know if anybody else has looked at that, but um, under the health equity, it, um, it said that we need an after action. They want a state after action review to evaluate what worked and what could be improved with the COVID um, situation and the vaccine. And then it said, as you just mentioned, vaccine equity, it's the North Star and key driver for control of COVID-19. And that we need to strengthen local public health systems, which is the blueprint for public health excellence. And so Jen's involved in the excellence and that we did do, the town did an after action review with our listening session. So um, Jen, do you wanna give us an update on the assessment and then other people to ask any questions? Yeah, well, you know, about the assessment and, you know, I, I just love this racism statement, but the assessment is really part of, you know, the four cornerstones of, of public health, you know, assurance policy and regulation. So what we're gonna be looking at is we have a meeting this Monday um, with UMass and we're gonna be looking at a community assessment and that's the first step that foundation is getting that information. So the first step is talking about where we wanna go with that and that'll be happening, happening Monday um, with one of our, our good partners at UMass Public School. 
Yeah, uh-huh. that was the the connection I had started back in June, mm-hmm. um, but we put it on hold after um, we didn't have a full time director. Uh, other thoughts on our next steps and where we should go. So uh, this is a quick question. You know, in in the state level, there is a the Office of Health Equity has put out a racial equity data roadmap. Um, it is just uh, mapping out, um, you know, I think this is at a state level, but I think they have a template on how to develop a roadmap, you know, and where we are going and where we are. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we can use those types of uh, templates, you know, and in developing some for Amherst, you know. Yeah, no, thank you, Tim. There's so many good toolkits out there. I've Tim, is that them. the blueprint for health equity? No, this one is a data roadmap, you know, just- Data roadmap, okay. Yeah, so that means- I missed uh, seeing that one. Yeah, the data roadmap is primarily developing baselines, but also seeing where we are and how we are progressing as a timeline. And I think it'll be good to use that data roadmap to develop one for Amherst. You know. I'll take a look at that. I know of that, Tim, but thank you for saying that. Yeah. And I missed it. Thanks, Tim. And I just have a question, Jen. Um, the, the cooperation with Northampton and other towns, is that really COVID related or is it more generally around strengthening public health ties among the towns? It, it's not just COVID. Yeah. Okay. It's really working. That's good to know. Yes. Yes. Thank you. You know, I'm I'm not going to be correct with this, but it's it's good for I uh, think two years with an option immediately for another three, and then it, it's just marched out of almost nine years. At, you know, into the wow. future. Okay. So it's really building these families. So it's not just a flash in the pan. That's good. Yeah, it is good. Right. Right. And thank you, Meredith, for doing that. Other comments, discussion? So uh, I, I, one additional one, I think it will be helpful because Amherst has so much <clears throat> multiculturalism, linguistics, you know, in terms of the variety of, you know, and a and, and lot of environmental justice issues too, you know, and, um, and I, I think that, you know, some sort of a, a developing action related to how our whole health um, planning and everything is culturally, you know, fostering cultural thing or benchmarking so that we are embracing that diversity and having there's some sort of access with related to language, because there's so many languages too, you know. Uh, so I'm just saying, you know, if something, you know, something like that we can think about, you know, how do we incorporate into our programming this uh, culture and linguistic diversity. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Yes, hi. I, I I have something to add as well. I thought I was unmuted. So I was, I've been trying to speak for a minute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I thought that the um, the statement um, that uh, the Board of Health that we adopted uh, for systemic uh, racism. Um, addressing systemic racism in, in, in health um, would include, you know, some of the following issues that I um, forwarded to um, you, Nancy, and um, Jennifer, yeah. and some of those were um, uh, access to whole food, um, uh, examining, like, the the problems of having um, low birth weight in 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 uh, women of colors um, newborns um, the impact of uh, the impact on the nucleus of um, extended family members uh, stress chronic disease high blood pressure mental health grief grief loss of loved ones to violence internalized racism low confidence and self-esteem, lack of representation, 
um, and authority in families um, and substance abuse. And I'm not sure if all those fit, um, but those are some of the points that I feel, um, you know, should be part of our examination of health and systemic racism. And I also just wanted to go back to um, how you were talking about equity and um, COVID response and, you know, people getting the, the vaccine who are um, part of free and reduced lunch or receipt of free and reduced lunch. Um, my son, who just is returning to the middle school, he says that the school lunch is terrible. <laughs> I want to put that <laughs> over. <laughs> that is terrible. Also, the um, the children still have to eat outside, which I don't know when that is going to end. But I I just feel like when you do get a a vaccine vaccination for you know protection from disease. Uh, your body has to be resilient in some way to fight that um, infection, whether it's, you know, through the air or through, you know, like a vaccine that you have decided to take. Um, but nutrition plays a lot into how your body is able to recuperate. And I would like, you know, that to, that our board be aware of that, that, you know, our children and the students in the school, you know, because they have, you know, many have had the vaccine, we also need to, you know, look at how the nutrition in the school is either helping them to be resilient and helping them to be as healthy as they can be since they've been, you know, a lot of their time in school and as you said a lot of students rely on free and reduced lunch and, and rely on the um the 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 food from that that is served in school so i just wanted to share that yeah thank you lauren thank you um so lauren a lot of those issues you brought up would come up under the assessment, I, I will send you the assessment tool um, that we, the proposal and the tool that we um, discussed at our, I think it was June meeting, I can't remember, that we're gonna be using when we talk to the people at the School of Public Health. Um, uh, Jen and I have the meeting Monday morning. Um, so it's it's just how, how how we look at it and then what is in the purview of the board versus the health department and then working with the school the school committee um uh, some of your issues really are 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 related to to them um uh, because things are sort of divided up um, a little bit but a lot of that will would come out in the assessment um, so any other comments? So the next step will be uh, moving towards the um, assessment. And then um, Jen has been working with the schools and to really improve equity in the um, vaccine right now. Other comments or other steps that you'd want us to take? Uh, one aspect which was brought up is the school lunch, you know. Uh, is there a assessment on the nutrition value or those type of things? Does our board involve in that or is it something out of our purview? That comes, I believe, Jen, from the federal government. Um, I, I, I really, do you know, Jen? I, I don't know. I, I know I can make a call and, and find out. 
But I remember under Reagan, there was a whole thing where he moved for school lunches that ketchup was a vegetable. And, and Michelle, I think with Michelle Obama's active, activism, I think there were some changes that got made, I, whether they've been revoked or not about more whole grain, you know, whole grain type foods or more vegetables and fruits and real food is not just your chicken nuggets or whatever. Mm -hmm. Betsy DeVos got the rid of a lot is, of what was going on. What, you know, I think that the, the school lunches are a tricky business. <laughs> Um, but but those guidelines but, I do believe come from the feds. But the programs like having a school um, garden and involving kids in mm -hmm. in food choices mm -hmm. and those kinds of interventions, I think, do have some uh, evidence based to results that are positive for kids' nutrition in school and out of school. You know, so I don't know. And I do think that a lot was changed under COVID because uh, the way foods were served, children being separated. So we have to just see once the COVID restrictions of safety for meals uh, improve. And I think I heard at least at the beginning of this year that that the supply chain issues were affecting school schools and school lunches. You know that the, the and perhaps even um, uh, workers to help provide those lunches and prepare those lunches. So I don't, it would be interesting to know if this is usual or if this is a, a, a diverges from the typical, although I think I would have vouched forever to say that school lunches were awful and my kids I think also said the same. So I, I don't know if it's just one of those things that is hard to move the needle on in terms of, of uh, how much kids like school lunch. Okay, maybe, maybe we can get UMass because they're number one. They're good. Dining yeah. experience to take over or help with our school lunches once all the COVID restrictions are lifted. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I saw an article that said that they serve 50,000 meals a day, UMass. I don't quite understand like my other um, son, he goes to an independent school and they, um, I keep telling everyone, I'm not sure why they don't um, have a meal plan there. Like all, all the students have to provide their own lunch. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know why the, um, the food can't be improved in the, the public schools. I really don't understand that. But can you just clarify what you, what you mean by the assessment? Because I'm not, I, I'm not sure as with the um, zero waste um, proposal, like how do we get the public to know this is something that is um, part of, you know, our, our agenda and, you know, what do you mean by the assessment, by the UMass assessment? It is a comprehensive community assessment and I'll send you the proposal and the tool that will be done. It's a, it's a very um, intense process. And in public health, um, it's identified as a core function and the primary piece that you need the assessment data to start your plans. So, um, we don't have the resources, the board or the health department to do it. And that's why we've reached out to the UMass School of Public Health to help us do that. And that's what our meeting would be on. Does that clarify it for you, Lauren? Mm -hmm. what, what, what kind of questions um, though are, what, what are you looking for? What, I'll, what questions? I'll send you the tool. Okay. It's really okay. in intensive and it's it the town is broken up by census tracts so that we can identify areas so I, I will send that material to you okay you but you've used the word equity is this specific to um uh racial equity or racial disparities 
ra- racial health disparities. I'm, I'm just want to be clear. Jen, maybe I don't know if I'm explaining it clear enough. Maybe you can. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're right, Lauren, I think you're asking good questions. I just, I think when we get the team together and, you know, Nancy and I are part of it, at that point, once we identify the, the community team, um, we start talking about what's the scope of our assessment and what that's going to be. And then we determine what's going to, the data that's going to be collected. Um, so it's, it's what we're looking at. So, you know, I can tell you that racial equity is a big thing. It's very important to the health department, to me. Uh, for ex- example, I know that COVID spread, you know, rapidly through multi-generational homes and Latino households. Um, so we're going to be asking questions about that. So it sort of unfolds as we start going on, but the, but that that's sort of the, the way that I look at it. And using the census data, we do look at race by census tract. But what I'm asking is when I thought, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I know that I, I'm sure that we're not into another part of the the meeting that is not dealing with the um, systemic racism. That's what we're talking about now, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, and you guys um, keep referring to COVID, and I want to know what other areas of public health and racial um racial inequities or racial um racism particularly racism that produce inequities how how are we going to assess that not just covid yeah, I, you know, one thing I can add is, you know, I think about the social determinants of health. And if we if we talk about, you know, um, living situations, education, food, um, uh, th- those are some of the things that we can take a look at as a broader, you know, umbrella and then dig down into those categories. And the assessment tool goes by social determinants of health. Does it, I, I haven't looked at it in a while and I can't remember, does it, it inquire about chronic health, chronic illness? Oh and, yeah, yeah, that's and, fine, yeah. Yeah, I thought it did, I thought it included that. Yeah. Um, some health outcomes are, or some health, I don't know if they're outcomes, but there's some health issues that are also part of that, not just the social determinants of health. Mm-hmm. And like reflecting on what Tim said earlier about languages and cultures and the, I guess you'll find out, but how well the um, UMass partners are able to help get into those areas where um, there may be different languages and barriers um, to kind of assess the town in, in a full and uh, diverse way. Um, mm-hmm. And focus groups are part of the assessment tool. Okay, and um, and even access to health care is a yes. disparity issue. That that is um, included in the assessment. I'll send you the tool, okay. Lauren. I'll I'll, I'll okay. do that by Saturday. I want, yes, I just want to make one other comment for someone who um is. Uh, a resident of Amherst for for five years. I've noticed like just how um, I don't know if the the board um, knows this that Amherst is considered a, a food desert. Yes. Um, so there's no the, the to to get to access um, a grocery store it takes a lot more effort, especially if you don't have you know, your own transportation and with um, health care, although there is, you know, places, health, health, you know, um, health places in the, you know, center of town, 
I would just like to know, do most residents, because I know we have the large student population and we have the seniors, but for, you know, that transitory um, population who might just be here um, three years or so, you know, getting on their feet or, you know, whatever. It just, to me, I, I just get the sense that people don't really get their health care here in Amherst. And I want to know if that's true. Is is that, you know, something that has been looked at at the past, you know, in the past, I, I, I would like that to be somehow included in our assessment. Mm, that's a good question. Okay, we're at 651. <laughs> so we will bring back the information about the assessment um, at our next meeting. Um, director's update. We did it before in the, uh, the other day. I'm looking around. It's like, yeah. yeah, I think I, I did that before yes. with the okay. COVID update. Um, I would like to add two things, though. Well, one thing is that we are considering uh, being in person in January for the Board of Health meeting. So everyone um, be prepared for next month so for us to make that decision, I believe. Um, and that would be here in the Bang Center. Okay. And quickly, I'm just going to do the tobacco handlers quiz. Um, I'm making some good headway. I'm working with Steve um, McCarthy in um, inspections. I'm going over what we have, um, organizing the same content a little bit differently, looking at some things in the MHOA, Massachusetts Health Officers Association, and working with Meredith um, uh, just to go over the quiz. So I just want to let you know that I've made some headway and I can report back. Uh, next month um, where we are. Thank you. So I have no topics and not anticipated. Um, and I don't think we have any other public comment. Well, you know, Nancy, I think it is a very good thing to have that on the board, yeah. on the agenda as so, an actual item. Yes. So why don't you just, just so we can get in the habit of it yes. and say, oh, so, we're open for public comments. We are. Think, you know, the idea would be. Yes. I just yes, suggested I the idea would be. Is there any public comment? No. And so that is, we're going to adjourn. So I have, may have a motion for adjourning. I second. Okay. All in favor, Lauren? Aye. Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Steve? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Well, thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Could, you know, could I, uh, after we, I have one question for Jen that's really just a, a health department, not to something for the board. So after we finish the meeting, if you, if you can stay on just long enough, I'll ask. Or I can do it by phone or something. Okay. So okay. I'm going to stop recording if we're all done with the meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Did you stop the recording?